and listen to the sayings of the wise. Apply your heart to what I teach, for it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart and have all of them ready on your lips so that I, I your trust, may be in the Lord. I teach you today, even you, have I not written thirty sayings for you, sayings of counsel and knowledge, teaching you truth and reliable words so that you can give sound answers to him who sent you. The word is a blessing. Hello, my name is Alana, and today I will be praying. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for making us up. We hope that anybody on the road right now, you will give them travel and mercy. I hope that you will bless the homeless people. Go past every hospital bed. Go past every jail cell. Heal this sick. I hope that you protect this world. And we thank you for people right now who are watching me pray and watching this service. I hope that everybody will have a blessed day. And I hope that anybody right now who needs help will get the help. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.
Job Trusts God About the time that Abraham lived, there was a man named Job. He was a good person who was kind to others. Job also respected God and desired to obey Him rather than sin. Job had seven sons and three daughters and loved each one of them very much. Job was a very rich person. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 oxen, and 500 donkeys. These animals helped him farm his land and trade his goods for other goods from faraway lands. Job also had many, many workers who took care of his animals and crops. Because of all his wealth, Job was the greatest person in his part of the world. Job's children enjoyed spending time together, so they would get together often to celebrate special days, like birthdays. Their celebrations involved big feasts and a good time together. Job wanted his children to honor God with their lives, so he would make a sacrifice to God the morning after the feasts, just in case one of his children had sinned. Job didn't want any sin to come between his children and God. One day, while the angels were presenting themselves to God, Satan came too. God asked Satan, Where have you been? Satan answered, Traveling the earth back and forth. God said, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him on the earth, a man who treats others kindly, respects me, and hates evil. Does Job fear you for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not kept bad things from happening to him, his family, and all his goods? You have blessed his hard work by allowing him to increase his possessions. Why wouldn't he obey you? But now, take away what he has and see how he reacts. I think he will curse you to your face. Then God said, Okay, Satan, all that he has, I will let you take from him. Only do not touch his body. Then Satan left to trouble Job. Later, a messenger came running up to Job and said, The Sabaeans stole your oxen and donkeys and killed your servants. I'm the only one who escaped. Then another servant came to Job and said, Lightning struck your sheep and the servants watching them, and I'm the only one who survived. Then yet another servant ran up and said, Three raiding parties of Chaldeans stole your camels and killed your servants, and I'm the only one who escaped. Still another servant hurried up to Job and said, A strong wind struck the house where your sons and daughters were feasting, killing them all. I'm the only one who survived. Then Job stood up, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground, and worshipped God. He said, I didn't have anything when I came into this world, and I can't take anything with me when I die. The Lord gave me a lot, and the Lord has taken it away. But God is still good and right. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job did not sin by blaming God for losing nearly all he had. Meanwhile, Satan came before God again. So God asked him, Now where have you been? Satan replied, traveling back and forth across the earth. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a kind and good person who respects me and hates evil? Did you notice Job trusted me even though he lost most of his goods and all his children? Satan said, A man would do anything to keep from dying. If you make Job sick, I know he will get mad at you and curse you to your face. The sickness will show that he does not really trust you. The Lord said, Okay, you have my permission to make Job sick, but the sickness cannot be so bad that it kills him. So Satan left and made Job sick with painful sores over his whole body from head to toe. Job was in constant pain and misery. Nothing he could do made him feel better. Finally, Job went outside his city and sat on a pile of ashes to show how much sorrow he felt. There he picked up pieces of broken pottery to scrape his skin to try to stop the terrible itching he felt. Job's wife blamed God for her husband's problems. She came to Job and asked, Do you still trust God? Curse him for allowing all these bad things to happen to you. 
and then die. Your life isn't worth living anymore. But Job said to his wife, What you are telling me to do is foolish. Should we accept good things from God and not bad? While Job sat on the ash pile scraping his sores, he did not say a single bad word against God. He believed that God is always good and always does what is right. We can trust God too. No matter what happens to us, God is always good. Good morning, New Bethlehem. This is the day that the Lord has made. Uh, let us rejoice and be glad in it. I don't know about you, but I'm happy to be alive on today, and I'm happy to be able to share God's word with you. If you have your Bibles, we'll be coming from the book of Job, chapter 1. It reads like this, In the land of Oz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. Amen. This is the word of God. Won't you pray with me? God, you're absolutely wonderful. And on this morning, we come to say thank you, Lord. Uh, God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And now, Father, I have to be honest. I feel so unworthy to stand behind this just sacred desk. But like you've done many times before, I pray that you will look past my flaws, look past my imperfections, and use me to speak these to these your people. We need to hear from you. We need a word from you. Spirit of the living God, have your way. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And just for a little while, I want to preach from the thought, when God levels you up, when God levels you up. Sunday, August the 20th, 2000, was the day that my mother dragged me down the center aisle of the New Bethlehem Baptist Church so that I could give my life to Christ. Nearly 23 years ago is when I started walking with God. Since I've been walking with God, since I've been on this journey of discipleship, I've come to realize that this journey can indeed be very challenging. In fact, if I had to sum up my entire journey this far, I would summarize it the same way that author Charles Dickinson did in the introduction of A Tale of Two Cities. He said, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incurability. It was a season of light. It was a season of darkness. It was a season of hope. It was a winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of the noisiest authorities assisted on being received for good or for evil. Uh, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that walking with God has been the best of times and walking with God has been the worst of times. I've been walking with the Lord and I've experienced love. I've been walking with the Lord and I've felt the devastation of hate. I've been walking with the Lord and I've seen the glory of his abundant blessings. I've been walking with the Lord and I've seen the heartache of brokenness. I've been walking with the Lord and I've seen his glory. I've been walking with the Lord and I've seen all hell break loose. I've been walking with the Lord and I've seen life. I've been walking with the Lord and I've seen life in prematurely. I've been walking with the Lord and I've felt his glory. I've been walking with the Lord and I've felt suicidal. I've been walking with the Lord and I've seen the glory of his righteousness. I've been walking with the Lord and I've seen the evil of darkness. A walking with God is indeed the best of times and the worst of times. And on today, I want to submit for your consideration uh, that sometimes before God can level us up, he literally has to level us 
He has to make us flat. He has to knock us off of our feet. My granny, uh, God bless her soul, used to tell me he's a God of mysterious ways. And the older I get and the more I walk with God, the more I realize that he is indeed a God of mysterious ways. You see, He's the kind of God that adds by subtracting, multiplies by dividing, and builds by breaking. Uh, but I want to suggest that that's all a part of God's leveling up process. And as we transition to the text on today, we are introduced to a brother by the name of Job. Uh, Job knows something about being leveled up by God. Uh, the onset of the text informs us that Job is a righteous, God-fearing man from the land of Oz and has a deep dislike for evil. The text also tells us Job is a family man. He has a wife, seven sons, three daughters. A uh, Job would regularly make burnt offerings on behalf of his children, saying, perhaps my children have sinned against God. Job was a uh, interceder. Uh, not only was Job a righteous, God-fearing family man, he was also a wealthy man. He made uh, some money moves and he owned a large number of livestock. He had a large number of servants. Uh, Job was the greatest man in all the East. I want to suggest to you on today uh, that Job was living his best life. He was living a life that many of us are striving for. He was living a life that many people admired. He was living a dream come true. However, as we continue to walk through this text, we can see just how quickly the dreams of life can turn into the nightmares of life. Uh, the Bible says in the book of Job that one day Satan reported to heaven with the angels and God asked him where he had been. Satan replied from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no one on earth like him. He is blameless, upright. He's a man who fears God and shuns evil. Uh, please allow me to put the content into context. The devil uh, went to heaven with the angels to report to God. And we do know that the devil has no authority to do anything in our lives without permission from God. That's why he reported to heaven. Uh, God asked Satan, where, you have, where have you come from? And Satan replied, from roaming the earth to see what kind of trouble I can get into. And without any insistence from the devil, God said, have you considered my servant, Job? There's no one quite like him, honest and true to his word, totally devoted to me, and he hates evil. Satan replied, so do you think Job does all this out of the pure goodness of his heart? No one ever had it so good. You pamper him like a baby. You make sure nothing bad happens to him or his family or his possessions. You bless everything he does. Job is winning. Uh, but what do you think would happen if you reached down and took away everything that is his? He curse you to your face. God replied, well, we'll see. Go ahead. Do what you want with all that is his. Just don't kill him. Then Satan left heaven and returned back to earth. Once back on earth, Satan had all of Job's livestock and his servants killed or stolen and also had all 10 of his children killed. So without any warning or preempting behavior from Job, God had allowed the devil to kill Job's family and destroy all of his stuff. 
And is there anybody in this house who knows what it's like? Uh, you were living right. You were going to church every Sunday, paying your tithes and offering, praying uh, like you were supposed to. You stopped cussing like you used to. Being a good person, then all hell starts breaking loose. I mean, everything that can go wrong started going horribly wrong. The car wouldn't start. The roof is leaking. Your job decided that they no longer needed your service. Your son has been arrested and decided he wanted to sell drugs. Your daughter is t is tired and she tried to commit suicide because she's being bullied at school. All hell is breaking loose. Uh, the dreams that you know are becoming the nightmares that you don't want. And this is not even the worst part. As we go back to the text in the second chapter, Satan again returned to heaven and God asked him uh, that question, where have you come from? And Satan replied from roaming the earth to see what kind of mischief I can get into. And again, God said, have you considered my servant, Job? Job, just don't kill him. And this time God allowed him to afflict. Job's health. Uh, and does anybody in here knows what it's like to already be down trying to hold it together? You're trying to hold your family together and now you have to deal with cancer and high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, uh, bad knees, bad hips. I feel like everything that I'm going through is going to make me lose my mind. Life has become a nightmare. And I can hear somebody saying, Preacher, I know uh, what you're talking about. I'm at the end of my rope. I want to throw in the towel. Life uh, has become a nightmare. And I want to know how do I survive life? When God is leveling me up, how do I survive life when God is leveling me up? Uh, the first thing that we have to do if we are going to survive the leveling up process is learn how to go through the process with him. Uh, several times throughout Job's process, Job, re Job reaffirms his faith. In God, uh, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. Uh, the Lord gave, and the Lord took away, but blessed is the name of the Lord. Though he slay me, uh, yet will I trust him. And I want to suggest to you on today, uh, Job was able to reaffirm his faith in God and go through the process with him uh, because he understood that this process has been designed by God. And it's when we get the revelation that the process is not here to destroy us, but rather to make us better, we can survive the process by letting him be who we need him to be in the process. If you are in need, let him be Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. If you need peace, let him be Jehovah Shalom, the God of perfect peace. If you're sick, uh, let him be Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. If you are lost and you don't know which way to go, let him uh, be Jehovah Roha, the Lord uh, who is my shepherd. If you're fighting a battle uh, that you can't win, let him be Jehovah Nisi, the Lord who is uh, my banner. If you're feeling lonely, let him be Jehovah Shama, the Lord who is very present. When you can't seem to uh, do right or get right, let him be Jehovah Sikanu, uh, the Lord our our righteousness and if you just need God uh, let him be El Shaddai the almighty God let him be who you need him to be through the process uh, the purpose of the process is that you go through it with God to grow closer to God to be stronger to God so that you can glow for God a uh, second thing that we have to do to survive the process of leveling up is to deal with the sores that the processes of life has caused us. 
Now the Bible says in Job 2, 7, 8, So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores on the soles of his feet and the crown of his head. Uh, then Job took a broken piece of pottery and scraped himself while he sat among the ashes. Uh, notice how Job immediately began to deal with the sores that the nightmares of life cause. I want to declare today uh, that some of us have had some sores and some bruises and some cuts and some wounds from the nightmares of life uh, uh, that we've been refusing to deal with for way too long. Some of us uh, know all too well what it's like to be emotionally done, mentally drained, spiritually dead, but physically smiling, smiling uh, with pain and hurt uh, because we refuse to address what life has done to us. Author and behavioral scientist Steve Amorabadi asserted the truth is unless you let go, unless you forgive yourself, unless you forgive the situation, unless you realize that the situation is over, you cannot move forward. A Shannon Adler proclaimed, forget what hurt you, but never forget what it taught you. A psychotherapist, teacher, and author, Dr. David Rashio observed saying, our wounds are often the openings into the best and most beautiful part of us and I want to help somebody right here who thought that life and what you went through made you ugly, undesirable or unwanted. That's a lie uh, straight from the pit of hell because uh, what you went through really just made you better. What you went through really uh, just made you bolder. What you went through really just made you uh, beautiful. You look at somebody and say you're beautiful. Type I'm beautiful. I'm beautiful. I'm beautiful. That's right. I'm better. I'm I'm bolder. I'm beautiful uh, because of the process. I smile uh, the way that I smile. I laugh the way that I laugh. I smell the way that I smell. I have the happiness that I have. I have the joy that I have. I have the peace uh, that I have. I love you even when you are wrong because of the nightmare. The nightmare has made me beautifully better. Author Lois Lowry said, the worst part of holding on to the memories is not the pain, it's the loneliness of it. Memories need to be shared. I want to suggest uh, once you learn how to deal with the sores, the scrapes, and the bruises, uh, don't be selfish, uh, don't be ashamed, but rather share your story of your scars so that people who are in the midst of the process know that they can make it and there is nothing uh, that God cannot do. Be a witness that he can turn your situation around. Be a witness that he can dust you off. Be a witness that he can turn your mess into ministry. Be a witness that he can mend uh, your broken heart. Be a witness that he can restore uh, your finances. Be a witness that there is nothing too hard for God. The nightmare has made me a beautiful, better, bold witness of God. If we are going to survive the process of leveling up, we have to first let God be who we need him to be. Uh, then we have to deal with the source. Uh, but lastly, we need to check the people in our space. The Bible says in Job 2 and 9, his wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Now, at first glance, it seems as if Job is being disrespectful to his wife. I mean, this is his wife, his rib, his helpmate. Uh, the lemon in his tea, the cheese on his broccoli, and he calls her a fool. And if you keep uh, reading the text, it says Job uh, did not sin for what he said. And I want to suggest that the reason that this was not a sin is because that anybody, and I don't care who they are, who is in your space, in your life, and they try to push you away from God or push you away from 
the sovereignty of God, who God is at that very moment, that person becomes the enemy. Uh, the Apostle Paul said it best in Romans 16 and 17. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause division and put obstacles in your way. They are contrary to the teaching that I have taught you. Keep away from them. And just like Job, too many of us have some foolish people, some toxic people, some leeching people in our space that's causing a delay in our breakthrough and keeping our process from ending. And what we have to learn how to do is check some people and release some unhealthy attachments, soul ties, situationships, relationships. And just in case you don't know how to do that, all you got to do is say, no, uh, you can't be in my friend. You can't be in my space. You can't ride in my car. You can't borrow any more money. We can't Netflix and chill. Uh, you can't uh, be in my business anymore. We don't need to connect on social media. You don't need to be my boyfriend. You don't need to be my girlfriend. Uh, you have to tell people how to get out of your space. You can't come over anymore. I'm not dealing with your foolishness anymore. No, I don't want no more of your drama. Matter of fact, go ahead and benedict some people out of your life. All you have to say is may the Lord keep watch between you and me while we are forever absent from one another. Uh, Job survived this process uh, because he checked some foolish people that was in his space. You can survive the process. I'm finished, but I can hear someone saying, Preacher, uh, you walked us through the first three chapters of the book of Job. And we've heard how he lost everything. We've heard about how sick he was. We've heard about his family and his friends acting funny and questioning his faith. And God, uh, what happened to Job? Uh, you called this sermon when God levels you up. But did he keep his faith? Did he die lonely and sick? What happened to Job? Well, I'm so glad that you asked. Because if you keep reading the book of Job, the Bible says in chapter 42, around verse number 12, uh, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life even more than the earlier part. He restored Job's health. He blessed him with 10 more children and all of the stuff that the devil stole from Job. God gave him back in a double portion. Has the devil stole anything from anybody on today? I just stopped by to tell you that the Lord is about to restore everything uh, that the devil has stolen from you. He's going to give you a double portion. I know you may not see it, but I just believe you're standing on the last page, on the last word of chapter 41. And I just believe that before... We leave this space. Uh, the Lord is going to turn the page. A matter of fact, I want to welcome somebody to chapter 42. Everything uh, that the devil stole is coming back. Double joy, double faith, double love, double uh, finances. I know uh, that it's been a hard process. I know uh, that you wanted to give up, but welcome to chapter 42. Uh, and I urge you to lift up your head. Lift up your head, O ye gates, uh, so that the King of glory uh, shall come in. You made it uh, through the process because of what the Lord did. Keep the faith and God will give you double for your trouble. Job lost everything and... He didn't waver from God. He didn't waver the process. He didn't question God. And many of us are going through a process. And I just want to encourage you to let you know that there is nothing too hard for God. That there is nothing that God can't do. Amen.
MBBC family and friends, help me thank Minister Kedrick for that mighty word from the book of Job on today. And beloved, if you heard the word of the Lord and you realize that you need a relationship with this God, the God in whom Job believed and in whom he trusted, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Won't you accept Jesus, our Savior, into your heart and into your life? Ask him to save you and be Lord today. Won't you go to the mbbc.org and click connect? Do it right now. Maybe you need to come back to Christ on today. You realize you haven't been as connected to him as you really need to be. Won't you go to the mbbc.org and click connect? Do it today. Maybe the connection you need to make is with the New Bethlehem Baptist Church. We would love to be your church family and you do not have to be in the Baltimore area to connect with us. You can go to the mbbc.org and connect with this church family on today. And if you're coming to Christ for the first time or coming back, won't you pray this prayer with me? Lord, I come in Jesus name. Lord, I confess I have sinned and I ask you to forgive me. Come into my heart, come into my life. Save me and be Lord. I believe you are the son of God. You came and died for me, rose for me, and you're coming back for me. And by the confession of my mouth and the belief in my heart, today I am saved. Beloved, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want you to go to the mbbc.org. We are waiting to hear from you on today. And we also want to give you an opportunity to connect with the ministry of the New Bethlehem Baptist Church through your giving. We invite each and every one to sow your seed, large or small. God said he loves a cheerful giver. And so we come now to present our tithes, our offerings, our dream seeds, and to say thank you to all of those, every heart, every hand, and every household we ask God's blessings upon even now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining the MVBC in this virtual worship experience. It has been our joy and our privilege to serve you in this way. We ask that you continue to keep us, keep our sick shut-in and bereaved members and friends in your thoughts, calls, and prayers. Remember to stay safe in these streets and be blessed. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with you. Henceforth, now and forevermore, let all the faithful folks say amen. Amen and amen. Big Wakanda hug from the MBBC.